At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce one of my favorite authors and speakers, Dr. Jerry Troyer. Dr. Jerry has studied religious science and new thought since 1992, and he received his ministerial license in 2005. He's a native of San Diego County, California, where he serves as staff minister at the Ohm Center for Spiritual Living in the San Diego area. And he is president of the Affiliated New Thought Network, an organization of independent New Thought Religious Science Centers, of which Creative Living Fellowship is a member church. Dr. Jerry is also the author of the acclaimed book, Coming Out to Ourselves, Admitting, Accepting, and Embracing Who We Truly Are. And if you haven't read it, go get it. He, is current, he currently lives in La Mesa, California with his beloved English cream golden retriever, Maggie. Please help me welcome the incomparable Dr. Jerry Troer. Thank you so much, Jeannie. And good morning, dear ones. It is my great pleasure to be back with you, at least virtually. Your theme for the month of August has been the kindness factor. And so we're going to finish up August talking about this experience of loving kindness. And thanks so much to Rhonda for the wonderful uh, meditation and also reading the quote from the book that I'm using. I wanna talk a little more about the, the concept of loving kindness and then we'll move forward. Um, loving kindness, as you, as you might know, defined in English dictionaries as a feeling of benevolent affection, but in Buddhism, loving kindness is thought of as a mental state or attitude cultivated and maintained by practice. In Pali, the word is metta. In Sanskrit, the word is maitri. And a quote from the... Um, Theravadian scholar, Arshara Bukharita writes, the Pali word metta is a multi-significant term meaning loving kindness, friendliness, goodwill, benevolence, fellowship, amity, concord, inoffensiveness, and nonviolence. Metta is defined as the strong wish for the welfare and happiness of others, True metta is devoid of self-interest. It evokes within a warm-hearted feeling of fellowship, sympathy, and love, which grows boundless with practice and overcomes all social, religious, racial, political, and economic barriers. It is a universal, unselfish, and all-embracing love. And so what I'd like to do this morning is talk about this concept of loving kindness, especially from the Buddhist perspective for others, as well as for ourselves. So I'm so glad you're with me this morning. Starting with this compassion and this loving kindness for other people. We have our tribe or because there's a dog under the dining room table, our pack. And if, if, you've, if you've had a, a cat or a dog as a pet, you know, or at least in, in some is, instances, they have their beloveds, they have their pack. My parents had a, a Dalmatian um, many, many years ago who just absolutely loved those of us who were part of the pack. And if you weren't, you couldn't come on the property, uh, which is a whole separate conversation. There was some stuff going on with that dog's past. But nonetheless, so our, our tribe or our pack are those people who perhaps look like us. They think like us. They talk like us. They love like us. They believe like us. And so it's easy very often to offer this loving, this experience of loving kindness to people who we know and have a lot in common with. The 
because I don't like the word challenge, the opportunity is to look at widening that circle to include people who we don't necessarily have anything in common with. My other day job is working with Urban Street Angels, which is an organization in San Diego that provides housing and life skills training and job referrals to homeless 18 to 25 year olds. I'm a founding board member and have been with the organization. Uh, well, it's been it's been 10 years, and thankfully, a couple of months ago, I started uh, as a, uh, started working as a staff member. So I'm there five days a week. It's the most amazing experience, and especially because, and many people have asked me, how did you get started working with homeless young people? Were you homeless? Were you rejected? Did you have that kind of experience? And the truth is, I did not. I was loved. I was nurtured. I always had a home. My parents were married for 65 years. We lived in the same house for 50 some odd years. So I did not have those experiences that so many of those young people did. And I think that's why this really touches my heart so much is because I I have no concept of what they've been through. And so I want to reach out and offer them that loving kindness that they might not have gotten recently or even ever in their lives through that experience. We want to say to them and we want to say to, to the people in our tribe as well as to everyone, God bless you. We don't say we don't use that expression very much in religious science or new thought many years ago the the church that i was pastoring was looking for another organization to share the space and so um, most of the people that came to see it were from traditional christianity and so the first time i met with one of the ministers as he was leaving he said god bless you and I looked around to see, did somebody sneeze? Because when we, so very often, the only time I say, God bless you, is when somebody sneezes. But listen to this wonderful explanation of the word, the, the expression, God bless you, and especially the word bless. This is from How to Love and Be Loved by Jack and Cornelia Addington. They write to bless a thing or a person in this case is to fill it with life. Life is expansion and the thing or person will expand and progress. To bless it is to enfold it warmly in your thought and feeling and consciously desire its fullest and most beautiful expression. To bless is to send forth a power which is of God and therefore omnipotent. To bless is to take an inward stance in a relationship to something. It is to speak the word of good and then to stand silently while the currents of life flow through the patterns of your thought. To bless is to release the hidden life in everything. So can we, and we certainly can, the people we love, the people we wanna hang out with, the people that are in our tribe or our pack, we can offer that blessing to them, but can we also offer that blessing to people who look different, act different, love different, differently, I guess, talk differently from us? Is there a way that we can do that? And of course, the short answer is, of course there is. As we recognize that, I am and you are the beloved of God, we must recognize, thank you, Jeannie, and you. We must recognize that so is everybody else. So what is this experience of loving kindness? To me, it's because now I, I work in downtown San Diego, which is pretty cool, and there are parking meters. So the experience of loving kindness is if I'm parking in a parking space and I'm only going to be at the bank for 15 minutes, it's going ahead and paying the full time. And somebody's going to come by afterwards and say, wow, how cool is that? It's paying for the coffee or the toll 
behind, for the person behind us. Several years ago, we were up, and I don't think you all have toll roads. You might, but in, and we don't in Southern California so much, but in Northern California, there was one and went over the, we were out a, a family a trip and, uh, and with, with people in the front seat, pack, people in the back seat, all scratching for money to come up to be able to pay the toll going across the bridge because we don't have those in Southern California. And we didn't have to worry about it because the person ahead of us had paid our toll. It was five bucks. It wasn't that big a deal. It was huge. It was massive. It was so wonderful. Offering loving kindness is offering undivided attention. Put your smartphone down, turn it over and either put it on. No, don't put it on vibrate or stun, turn it off and offer that undivided attention. Loving kindness is taking advantage of the holy instant, which is, you know, that Mo those few seconds, of Course in Miracles talks about this, those few seconds after something happens or somebody says something and rather than immediately reacting or responding, it's allowing ourselves to take those few seconds to decide, do I need to react to this? How will I do it coming from love? And if I'm having a hard time coming from love, why is this bothering me so much? Compassion and understanding and unconditional love as part of this experience of loving kindness. I love Facebook. Now, I'm not a stockholder. I have no financial attachment to Facebook, but I just find the most amazing postings. And there's some goofy stuff out there. And so you just keep scrolling. But I'd like to share this with you. And um, if if you'd like a copy of it, feel free to reach out to me, friend me on Facebook and reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to, to send it to you. The title of this is Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lamaris. And this was written in about 2019, and this really touched my heart. So bear with me if I just get a little bit emotional. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by. Or how strangers still say, bless you, when someone sneezes. A leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly, we don't wanna harm each other. We wanna be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them, for them to, and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now so far from tribe and fire. Only these, only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy? These fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. So the opportunity to share this loving kindness might look as, look as something really big and it might be something small to us, but massive to someone else. So we've talked about loving kindness for other people and now we'll talk about quite possibly the more difficult one in loving kindness for ourselves. You remember, Jesus in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus was asked the greatest commandment, commandment, and he said, 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second one is equally as important to love one another as yourself. How do we treat ourselves? Do we love and, and, and offer compassion and loving kindness to ourselves? So often, I don't know about you, but so often I start my day in not enoughness. I don't know if that's a word, but I used it, so it is now. Not enough sleep, not enough coffee, not enough time, not enough money, not enough wisdom, not enough, and you, you, get, the, you get the idea that the list goes on and on. And then because life does what life does, and if, if we are affirming that, that we're not enough and everybody else is not enough and we don't have enough, then the universe says, well, okay. And it just keeps going versus I am enough. I have enough. There is enough. This wonderful book, uh, Radical Acceptance by Tara Brock, she talks about this trance of unworthiness and that somehow we're not enough. Uh, whether we got it as a message from our families growing up, whether we got it from the old residue of original sin, whatever it is, there's the opportunity, again, not challenge, but opportunity to check in and say, and with ourselves and determine what we really believe about ourselves. Sometimes in this not enoughness, we work really hard with self-improvement projects. And I love the classes and the meditations and the workshops that y'all do at CLF. And that's bringing you closer to the truth of your being. And that's wonderful. But sometimes our motivation is I'll be okay as soon as I get the degree or get the whatever it is. And it's kind of like frosting a cake. Now, admittedly, I don't bake. There is no way in this life or the next one. But if you've ever had a cake and then frosted it, you plop the frosting and you use the knife or the spatula and you, you design. And then you design. And then you keep designing. And at one point, at what point do you finally say, that's enough? At what point do we say, I am enough and I have enough? Sometimes we stay stuck in past or future so that we don't allow ourselves to be in the lusciousness of this moment and to admit that maybe this moment is not so luscious. Uh, la I think the last time I was with you in person, we talked about the experience of grief, grief and loss, and how so often we don't allow ourselves to feel what we feel and instead cover ourselves with toxic positivity. Yes, everything is in divine order. Yes, everything is as it should be, but I'm feeling this grief, I'm feeling this loss. And so in this experience of loving kindness, we allow ourselves to be with those feelings, to feel them and process them through. We focus on other people's stuff. You know, your life would be so much better if you would just, and you get to fill in the blank. And of course, as I'm looking at your stuff, you, again, using a purely metaphysical term, as I'm looking at your stuff, I don't have to look at mine. So there's the opportunity to say, hmm, what's going on here? And maybe there's something else that I need to do in my life uh, and not get so involved in yours. This, in the book, uh, Tara Brook writes, this, this experience of radical acceptance is pausing and then meeting whatever's happening inside us with unconditional friendliness. Again, yes, I'm feeling frustrated because I really wanted to be in Phoenix this weekend. And instead, where it's a hundred and something. And so instead I'm in San Diego where it's 80 something, but still, so we're, st we're not there yet. And so there can be that frustration and we recognize that. And 
honor that and allow ourselves to feel what we feel. Do you remember that wonderful writing by the Sufi mystic poet Rumi? He and he writes about the guest house, that this being, this being human is a guest house with all of these guests of love and compassion and understanding and grief and anger and struggle. And we invite all of them in and greet them at the door laughing because that's part of who we are. That's part of this experience of being spiritual beings having the human experience. In the book, uh, The Gifts of Imperfection, Brenny Brown writes, owning our story, our guest house, and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we will ever do. So what's going on in our lives today? And can we feel it, allow it, offer compassion for it, just as we would for someone else that we were talking with, and then allow ourselves to process it through. We bring, we bring alive the spirit of radical acceptance when instead of re resisting emotional pain, we're able to say yes to our experience, yes to this moment. This messy, under construction, not there yet, moment. It's the truth of our being. It's who we are. It's, and it's wonderful. I'd like to close with a quote from the book, Radical Acceptance. And so I invite you to, we'll do this as my closing meditation. So I invite you to just take a breath if you'd like and get comfortable where you are. My beloved child, break your heart no longer. Each time you judge yourself, you break your own heart. You stop feeding on the love which is the wellspring of your vitality. The time has come, your time, to live, to celebrate, and to see the goodness that you are. Let no one, no thing, no idea or ideal obstruct you. If one comes even in the name of truth, forgive it for its unknowing. Do not fight. Let go and breathe into the goodness that you are. And so as we stay in this consciousness, we recognize our oneness with spirit, with the universe, with all of life. And in this oneness, we must be the essence, expression, and experience of spirit, just as everyone else is too. So moving forward today, we allow ourselves to offer this experience of loving kindness to others as we do for ourselves. We see that we're enough. We see that we're the beloved. We see and feel that we're always doing the best we can. We hold ourselves in love and light as the beloved child. For this day, for this technology, for this beloved spiritual community, we give great thanks and together we say, and so it is.